What happens when management values are different from employee values? What happens when such difference leads to work actions such as walkouts and employees quitting the job? Matt Kelly and I take a deep dive into this issue in the context of Fleischer Meats and Activision on this episode. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, the voice of compliance, back again with Matt Kelly, the coolest guy in compliance, for another episode of Compliance Into the Weeds. Today, we are going to both go look backward and go forward. By looking backward, we're going to look back to our junior high for me and middle school for Matt days in the, in the topic of Venn diagrams, but we're going to bring that forward to a headline literally ripped from the news. So, Matt, with that opaque and oblique introduction, you want to tell our listeners what we're going to talk about today? Yeah, sure, Tom. So I have been thinking lately about uh, corporate culture and specifically the corporate values and ethical priorities that organizations have and the forces that act on those values and priorities and how different stakeholder groups or different concerns within a big organization try and exert influence to make sure that they get to dictate the values and priorities and who gets to dictate what. Um, And ultimately then I wound up in my radical compliance blog post, sketching out some ideas on Venn diagrams. So everybody listening, I encourage you to go read my post, not just because it's awesome, which it is, but because I have a lot of Venn diagrams. I will do my best to describe those now to convey my points about corporate culture and values. Uh, But even though that sounds like a lot of abstract theory, there's actually also some very real specific cases in the news these days that demonstrate the various forces tugging on corporate al- values and priorities. So um, we can talk about those too, Tom, but that, that's what's on the agenda today. Well, that's a really interesting way to phrase it, Matt, because I had a little bit different interpretation after reading your blog. I really thought that this was a struggle between not simply uh, employees and management but a much broader conversation about ethical values and how numerous stakeholders are involved in that discussion, but also how much that changes and how you have to be able to assess that change uh, going forward. So um, let's dive into it. Sure. And and actually, Tom, just the way you described it, I think, is, is very valid. Um, well, it, it is definitely not a Manichaean tug of war between one group and another, but more a constant jockeying for the upper hand, and not even just between management and employees, but several different groups. And so for compliance officers, if you're trying to understand what your corporate culture is going to be, what you want it to be, what you want your ethical priorities to be, you really have to appreciate all these forces and groups that are trying to jockey for a better position to dictate or to exercise influence over what those priorities and values are. So let me give you an example, a very simple example of what I mean, and that just happened within the last couple of weeks. So there is a butcher shop uh, based in New York City called Fleischer's, which I had not been familiar with until now, but Fleischer's Uh, is a high-end butcher shop. It has four locations in New York and Connecticut. Uh, Apparently, it is known as offering the most expensive steak in the world. Uh, That includes a dry-aged porterhouse ribeye steak that sells in Las Vegas for $20,000. So that's out of my price range. And uh, also some 60-ounce servings of steak for $1,000 a piece. Fleischmann's was founded in 2004, and these days it has roughly 40 employees across four locations. So here's what happened, is that toward the end of July, the employees in the Westport, Connecticut location hung a Black Lives Matter uh, sign and a gay rights rainbow flag sign in the windows of their Westport location. And a friend of the owner of Fleischer's, And Fleischer's is owned by a real estate developer whose name is Ron Rosiana, I believe. But a uh, so this private equity owner of Fleischer's, a friend of his called him up and said, look, I don't like these signs in your window. That's uh, political activism and you shouldn't have it and take those things down. 
So the owner decided to take them down. And he directed the CEO of Fleischer's, a relatively new employee there. He only started as CEO uh, earlier this summer. His name is John Adams. Uh, he took the signs down from the Westport location. And then he took similar signs down in one of the New York City locations. And then all the employees quit. And he panicked. Uh, within 24 hours, that CEO, John Adams, had decided to put the signs back up in the Westport location and in the New York City uh, store as well. He reached out to the employees who had all quit. And roughly 70% of them were still not on the job as of this weekend. So as a practical matter, Tom, Fleischmann's or Fleischer's, uh, Fleischer's had to close all four of its stores because its employees got so offended at management deciding to take down these signs that they all left. And it's worth noting that out of the 40 or so employees, a significant number of them, and I believe a majority of them, are people of color or gay employees, or they have some sort of, uh, I'll just say diversity or minority demographic. Uh, this is a highly diverse workforce where clearly Black Lives Matter and the gay rights movements were very important to them. Management decided it wasn't important to the company. They took the signs down. The employees exercised a, I guess you call it a retaliatory response by quitting and walking off the job and getting new labor, getting jobs elsewhere. And so Fleischmann's all four stores has been closed now for at least two weeks. I don't know if they're open now, but they were not open as of the weekend. And a significant number of the employees who quit had found other employment. So I don't know if they're ever going to go back or how Fleischer's is going to hire replacement workers or what's going to go on. But, Tom, it struck me that that was a really simple, clarified battle over corporate ethics, values and priorities. Management had one set. Employees had another set. They disagreed. And who had the upper hand there clearly were the employees. Um, so if we want to talk about Venn diagrams, you could see maybe having one bubble be management, one bubble be employees, and the overlap of those two bubbles is where your ethical priorities would be defined and fought over and pressured and articulated. But what has happened lately, because of the economic conditions these days where food service workers are in high demand, uh, that employee bubble has become much larger. So they get to crowd out the power that management has to define corporate values and priorities. And basically, like the employees had the upper hand here. They had the power. They used it. And I don't know what Fleischer's is going to do to rectify this situation, but it was a very neat, simple example of which parties exercise how much influence over corporate priorities and how your power to influence might change over time. And I could easily see maybe in 2008 at the financial crisis when unemployment in this country was 11 percent, perhaps the opposite would have been true that management's bubble in the Venn diagram would have been much larger. And you have to think about how many bubbles are there? How big are these bubbles? How big are they over time as different factors influence the, the size of these bubbles in the Venn diagrams? And Tom, we could talk about Venn diagrams all day, want, all day long if we wanted, but that was my point there. We're talking about Fleischer's, just to give a very simple example of how you would map out the pressures on corporate ethics, values, and priorities. We're going to have a quick message from our sponsor, and then we'll be back with more Compliance Into the Weeds. So let me step back with a couple of observations. The first one is we rarely get such a clear example of cause and effects, cause and effect uh, I don't want to say neatly wrapped, but uh, very confined where it was clear what actions led management to acting, what actions led the employee to act, acts, actions, and then what um, the result was going forward. So we really have uh, as, as fine a case study of this as I think we've seen lately. The, uh, the second thing, though, Matt, is when I read your blog post the first time, what struck me it was that these circles, which are a part of the Venn diagram, can morph and they can change. And you, you articulated 
uh, one great example, which was the power of employees uh, in the current labor market vis-a-vis 2008 or any other times where we've had higher mm-hmm. unemployment than today. But then you went on to, to use this same uh, sort of analysis uh, by adding more bubbles. And you picked Activision Blizzard, which we've talked about previously on this podcast. But why don't you uh, tell us how you thought through adding more bubbles, what, what those bubbles might be, and then maybe move to do the, do the bubbles change? Yeah, so I, I can appreciate that a lot of people listening here might say this is a really good theory for a 40 person butcher shop. But for me, the listener at a very large organization, there's a whole lot more complexity into what determines corporate values and corporate ethical priorities in my business. So how, mo- how far does that model really take you? That's a fair point. So I was thinking specifically about Activision and their struggles these days, where clearly they have a big fight over their corporate culture, their ethics and priorities, where they had a terrible corporate culture for many years that was rampant with sexual harassment. And it finally exploded several weeks ago when California regulators filed a lawsuit against the company employees staged a walkout, management made some very ill-advised statements about the allegations against the business and social media commentary it had blown up. And I really, it occurred to me, those are the bubbles. So at a larger organization, rather than having two bubbles that overlap, you would actually have two rows of two, a total of four bubbles that would be stacked on top of each other. And I'll do my best to, to walk through it all. But you know, I, again, it's worth looking at a visual representation that whether it's in the show notes or whether it's going to be on my blog. But take a look. You would have management and employees opposing each other. Those would be two of the four bubbles at a large company. But I think the two others you would have would be regulators. And then I also said social media, but it really could just be other stakeholders, such as investors or consumers or anybody else. And I even stacked them. So I would say social media and employees are on one side, while management and regulators are on the other side. And in the very center of these four overlapping bubbles of the Venn diagram, that's the corporate ethical priorities and the corporate values. And so you've got four different forces, at least, operating and positioning and moving to see if they can dictate what the ethical priorities are. Uh, And so, Tom, again, what I had mentioned before with um, the Fleischer's Butcher is you have to assume that the size of these bubbles, the relative strength of each group, that's going to change over time. And I think what has happened now is that the management bubble has shrunk enormously because they look terrible. They're on the back foot. They have been apologizing for a week and a half about how they made ill-timed statements at the beginning, and then they apologized for their corporate culture, and they supported the walkout and all this stuff. But clearly, management's ability to influence what are the ethical priorities here, that's shrunk. Who's dictating it right now? Well, the regulators, because by filing a lawsuit, they threw a sharp elbow at the company and left the company reeling with all of these allegations against it which immediately then set off the employees who finally were saying, yes, great, now somebody gets it and we can rise up and air all of our grievances we've had for many years. And then all the other commentators on social media or consumers or other stakeholder groups, they also are saying, well, I don't know that I want to support a company that has treated its female employees so terribly for so long. So imagine a Venn diagram with four bubbles, but the one in the lower quadrant representing management is now shrunk and tiny, or the other three are huge and large, depending on your perspective. But that's what has happened right now with Activision. Conversely, you could have said, well, what was it like five years ago? What was it like 10 years ago? And 10 years ago, while Activision apparently still had a very terrible corporate culture, The regulators were nowhere. The employees had very little ability to change it, so they were just sitting there and taking it, and nobody else was really paying attention to the company's uh, corporate culture and its values and its behaviors. So in that world, the four-circle Venn diagram, management's power would have been huge. 
while the others were very small. And you, if you kind of played it forward as a time-lapse movie or something like that, I think what you would have seen is suddenly regulators' power got very large because they filed the lawsuit, and that triggered the other three bubbles to get very large while management shrank down. And I know that we're talking about a lot of theory here and pictures and whatnot, but my point with all of this is to help compliance officers understand what a good model it would be to map out your corporate culture and who is trying to influence it. Because that is something compliance officers should think about quite a lot. Uh, you could say something like, well, we know the economy is strong, so that means we should enlarge the size of our employee bubble. Because if we have lousy corporate values in their eyes, they might quit. Um, you could say a new law has just been passed that regulators are going to enforce vigorously. So now I have to consider that and make the regulators bubble larger relative to management on the Venn diagram. You can play around with this and get a, a better sense of which groups, which stakeholders, which uh, influencers exert how much power over dictating the ethics and priorities of the company. And from there, you can start to derive, well, if this is likely to shape the corporate values, how should we, the company, respond? Should we be more sensitive to employees? Should we be implementing more policies and procedures to keep regulators happy? You can start to reverse engineer what your responses should be if you have a more accurate way to model out what are these forces that are pressuring your corporate culture and pressuring what's important to your workforce. And that's where I was trying to go with these Venn diagrams and these analyses of uh, Fleischer's butchery and of uh, Activision Blizzard. But I think you could do it with many other businesses as well. Matt, in reading through this, I originally thought that this was a, a different form of a risk assessment. And then I evolved my thinking to that perhaps this was a actually a a more specific type of risk assessment, a cultural assessment. But now I'm thinking this may be yet something different, but whatever we call it, it's a tool. And it's a tool that can be used by a chief compliance officer uh, to move to other steps, whether that be a culture assessment or a risk assessment. Would, would that be a valid statement? It is. And in fact, Tom, after I was writing this and I looked at my Venn diagram and my circles, uh, I was actually thinking of another geometry illusion here. Tom, you and I have talked before about the fraud triangle, where there are the three sides of the fraud triangle are pressure, rationalization, and opportunity. And uh, a couple of years ago, I was on a tear where I wrote about the fraud triangle as a tool that we always see that fraud triangle as an equilateral. But that's not actually how these forces to commit fraud exist at a company. You might have a lot of pressure, you might have very little opportunity, you might have vice versa, it might be very easy rationalization. But if you mapped your company's pressures around fraud, you might come up with a very unusually shaped triangle specific to you, the company. And from there, a compliance or audit executive could start to reverse engineer, well, what's the training, what are the values, what are the controls that we should implement to respond to the fraud risks specific to my business. And that's on the triangle. I would say that these Venn diagram circles, this, this model or this tool, you could use it the same way to get a good sense of what are these pressures that exist at my company? And then how could I reverse engineer the changes that we would have to make in policies, in controls, in executive messaging, in reaching out to other stakeholder groups? Um, because you'd have a better sense of which ones really do have more influence or how their influence has suddenly changed because of some external event. So I definitely think it would be a tool. And I promise people some other day, I'll come up with a Pentagon or a square or some other thing for corporate governance somewhere down the road. Well, Matt, I remember that blog post and I remember thinking at the time, you didn't say it specifically, but it was clearly an allusion to Pythagoras. And so I just want to say this is the first time on Compliance Into the Weeds that I think we've been able to cite to Pythagoras um, and the Pythagorean theorem. Uh, 
uh, going forward. So uh, for all of those uh, people who don't think they got anything out of 10th grade geometry, take heart. Uh, you now have skills to be a compliance professional, courtesy uh, the coolest guy in compliance. So um, there you go. I was just going to say, Tom, my 10th grade geometry teacher, Mrs. Brosnahan, would be delighted. I, if, I hope wherever she is, she might get to see or hear this podcast, too. But, yeah, there, there's a lot that can be done here. Well, Matt, uh, you got a few wrap-up phrases to take us home on how the compliance professional should be using this, not just can be using it. Well, I, I think that you should definitely think about what are the number of bubbles in my Venn diagram? I came up with four. I'm not saying it has to be four. You might find uh, only three, or maybe there's a fifth bubble out there. But figure out who are these groups that are exerting influence. Uh, what is their proportionate influence to map all of this out? And then keep on thinking, how does that change over time? Because this really ultimately is not a two-dimensional Venn diagram image. It's more like a movie of Venn diagram bubbles that raise, that increase or shrink or enlarge or whatnot over time. That's what's going to give you a better sense of what events might shape or change your corporate priorities and your corporate values. You don't want to be caught on the backside of that unprepared. You want to be able to see what's coming and respond to it and anticipate it in advance. That's what keeps a good ethical culture and keeps a compliance program ahead of things. Matt, great way to end it. I look forward to uh, seeing what we come up with for next week. Thank you, Tom. Stump Fox, I hope you enjoyed this episode of Compliance Into the Weeds. I've linked to Matt's article in our show notes, so check that out. It's a fascinating case. I'll be writing about it shortly as well. I hope you'll join us again next week where Matt and I take another deep dive, literally going into the compliance weeds for another episode of Compliance Into the Weeds. I also hope you will check out our latest podcast on the Compliance Podcast Network, the ESG Report. The ESG Report takes a deep dive into ESG from the compliance perspective. It's available on the Compliance Podcast Network, or you can subscribe and have it delivered directly to your inbox by going to the FCPA Compliance Report. Thanks again for listening. I hope you'll join us again.